I'm not normal human being. If I, I would be, I would not be practicing violin, I would be doing something else. It's no use practicing too much. You first you have to find out how to do it the best. You have to you have to be able to invent ways of doing it better. Somebody doesn't know what invention means, you should stop violin playing. <laughs> I can, you can't explain everything. <laughs> Howard didn't explain to me. This is a story of one of the finest violinists of the 20th century, Natan Mironovich Milstein, who was born in Odessa on the Black Sea in 1903, and whose boisterous spirits landed him in so much trouble that at the age of seven, his mother thrust a violin into his hands to keep him out of mischief and took him to Pyotr Staliarsky for lessons. With Staliarsky, he made such astonishing progress in four years that at the age of 11, his mother took him from Odessa to St. Petersburg to the class of the legendary Leopold Auer, where he made quite an impression. There are many pupils, some of them very famous, eventually became famous, like Yasha Haipitz, Polyakin, Zeidel. And uh, after I finished, and he says, to, uh, addressing to the pupils, he says, well, how do you like that ch ch uh, Black Sea technique in the Chernomovska technique? 72 years later, at his last public recital, his playing retained the same arresting freshness and astonishing accuracy that so impressed Leopold Auer in 1914. No other violinist in the 20th century has been able to play like this at the age of 82. After I finished addressing to the pupils, he says, well, how do you like that ch ch uh, Black Sea technique in the Chernomorska technique? I don't remember what people answered. Whatever the answer, the word went around that Auer was so stunned that he fainted, and the rumor was to have interesting consequences for the Milstein family. I supposedly made extraordinary impression, it's not true an hour that hour fainted. There was some correspondent in conservatory says, what, what's new? And they told him that there was a Russian played in hour fainted. It's not true. And that was very disturbing for Glazunov, who is the director of conservatory. And he asked my mother and myself to come to, to his cabinet. And he said, you know, Mrs. Michelin, it's, it's not done like that. It's, it's not supposed to. My mother was not responsible that somebody wrote that he fainted. Anyway, he felt guilty yeah, that he offended a lady. And he said, Mrs. Mission, bring your son to the orchestra pit. You can't go in the, or uh, the opera because it's all for imperial family and corps diplomatique. And I was... For me, for Russians, Tsar was like next to God. 
And of course I was thrilled when I saw that. He then comes Boris Godunov, Sharapin falls on his falls on his knees and he said all the coronations seen for the Russian Tsar on knees. That's how I came because Glazunov asked me to come. And that's what impression did it make on you? I, I, I was almost sick for 10 days. At that time, people didn't imagine that's possible. Emotion can you disturb you so much. And so he discovered his artistic sensitivity and a passion for music that has lasted until this day. Among the great performers, the story is not uncommon, except that in Natan Milstein's case, it was not an instrument that so impressed him, but the music of Mussorgsky, and above all, the performance of Shalyapin as Boris. In fact, until that moment, Natan Milstein had been a rather reluctant student of the violin, at the watchful insistence of his mother. She insisted. She didn't come with the revolver. She didn't force that way. She simply insisted. And he insisted that mother at that time means she will win. <laughs> I wouldn't win at all. She wanted me to play violin and I, I, I succumbed to it. I don't mind much. It didn't do any harm to me. There was not much to mind about. At the age of 11, Nathan Milstein opened his ears to music, his eyes to the glories of St. Petersburg, found himself in company with Yasha Heifetz and several other notable talents in the violin class of Leopold Auer, the foremost teacher of his time. And all of this under the loving care of an intelligent and devoted mother. Because my mother made me play violin and she went with me to St. Petersburg, abandoned the family, seven children, six children without me. Can you imagine? I loved her for that. But I, not because of violin. I didn't like so much violin. But after I went to St. Petersburg, I was attracted because there's so many other violinists playing much better than I. And that they attracted me. I tried to imitate them. It was not long before the rest of the class was trying to imitate Natan Milstein, whose talent and application had a sure-footedness about them that was in time to win the admiration of most of the great performers of the 20th century.
I used to go uh, to the conservatory at uh, Nihach because already when I was at St. Petersburg, it's always but snow. Wonderful. <laughs> snow is crisp. And the color of the snow was sometimes like a pearl. Yellow, green, pink, wonderful. That was beautiful. And the St. Petersburg, beautiful forests. They're all white birch. You know, birch is that the, and the, when the light, sunshine comes through the forest, beautiful. And the, the wonderful part was our class. Knowing that he's a famous man, not only because he did something, and he was old. I used to respect very old. In our class, he met and competed with the best young violinists in St. Petersburg. But one day, he encountered a young pianist, and it led to a dramatic turning point in his life and career. A young Vladimir Horowitz was brought by one of his teachers to Natan Milstein's first concert in Kiev. At my concert in Kiev, near Chernobyl, <laughs> I played there. Horowitz came with his sister, and they invited me to next day for tea, his family. And I came next day, we had tea, and I stayed for three years in their house. You know me, the men that came to dinner. I came to tea, stayed three years. But Horowitz impressed me with extraordinary knowledge of all operatic music. He played Wagner, played Rimsky-Korsakov, Wagner, Siegfried, when Siegfried sharpens his sword. Beautiful. And he, the cock door, Rimsky-Korsakov, he arranged for piano without writing, he played. I couldn't believe it. And so began a friendship that would last a lifetime, and a youthful partnership that took them on many a tour of the new Soviet Union, and earned them the title, Children of the Revolution. When we were called Children of the Soviet Revolution, every ministry of art in every city had a committee that helped us to give concerts. And we used to take the money from the public and the, the expenses were paid by the government. It was very comfortable. They enjoyed themselves, travelled far and wide and caused a great stir. But not all of their experiences were so comfortable. There was a kind of a funny man. He had golden hair in a toga with wooden shoes. Obviously he was a communist, but he thought that workers need great music. And he arranged a concert in near Rostov, where the factory was, cigarette factory, 20,000 workers. I supposed to play Bach, and Horowitz played Liszt. And of course, it was big ado. And he, Mr. Abrahamov, he talked for, about Bach, polyphonic music, about fuga, can you imagine, to 20,000 workers. And um, he said, that's wonderful music, that's now you can enjoy that music, before you couldn't. And there were many shoeshine people, boys. Those shoeshine boys, they didn't mix words. If they didn't like something, they would say that. And I started to play, after he talked for an hour, they tolerated his talking because they thought, we, well, Lord and I will come start to make some very gay, music. And when I started to play Bach after two minutes of playing, they said, said, it means go away. 
not the workers. The workers were always shy. But those shy, too shy, they were not shy. When they said, go away, the, the workers helped him. And then Abramov came on the stage and said, look, you not grateful, you know, we give you great music, you know, the, before the capitalists only enjoy that Bach and be quiet. And he went, I came back to the stage, played again, continued Bach. Even less than three, three minutes, they started to say Butko again, go away. Of course, I left and uh, Mr. Abramo with the golden hair came down stage. He started to scold them. He said, look, you should be ashamed of yourself. When the capitalists, they enjoy that music and they, very difficult to understand. I understand that it's very difficult, uh, but you have to try to be, he said, if somebody doesn't want to um, listen, they should not spoil other people's pleasure. If you want to go, go away, but let it, don't be quiet. I started to play, started again. And he said, I told you if you want to go away, you go, but don't make noises. Yes, Mr. Abramov, we want to go away, but all the doors are closed. An inauspicious start for the children of the Soviet Revolution. But the music of Bach remained an abiding passion. And while still in his teens, he played all of Bach's music for violin and learned most of it by heart. Soon, his apparently effortless and strikingly seamless playing of Bach became a source of wonder for contemporary musicians. And then, one day, Sergei Rachmaninov heard him play the E major Bach partita and was so impressed that he arranged three of the movements for piano for a recital in the Salle Pleyel in Paris and to which he invited Nathan Milstein. Uh, 
and he made three pieces from the partita for the piano. And eventually I heard them. When he invited me to his concert, he paid in Salpleyel in Paris for the benefit of the immigrants. And he said, Mr. Michelin, listen to the, how do you like it? And I told him after the concert, I like everything except that chromatic sequence, which is not good for Bach. And uh, he told me, go to hell. I have always, like everybody sent me to hell. And I was very upset. Not only because I, Yerachman was upset, because after concert there was a reception at his daughter's in Paris, supper. And I'm sure that I couldn't go anymore. But Miss Natalia Alessandrova, his wife, was not so Natalia Rolch. Don't pay attention, and he was nervous. You come with us. And I went up to the concert. And there were four composers. Glazunov, Grechaninov, Konius, and Metnar. All the great musicians. We sit, and he says, first thing he says, Sasha Glazunov, did you hear in the Bach some chromatic sequence? Glazunov didn't think, he probably didn't listen even. He was more, more thinking about his wine and beer he will have at the dinner. And that was the, probably everybody, Grishanino, Vimeta, and Konius. I was the only one that heard it. I was upset because I thought maybe it was my bad taste. Do. No good. And if no for Bach. And he was not satisfied, but I left, of course, but I still had my uh, Russian cutlet and a little vodka. And uh, next morning, I went to buy the newspaper. And coming back, uh, Mr. Mishnah, Mr. Rahman, I would like to see you now. And I was boring, maybe it was. He sent me to, you know, to hell to, to something else. I got up, opened the door, he looked through bashfully, not daring to go in. He says, Natalia Roch, call me, vous avez raison. You are right, you are right. Vous avez raison, je fais ça. There are many occasions there was, he said, Vladimir Simeonovich, because something happened with Horowitz. And he says, Horowitz says, no, I don't believe it. The Rahman says, no, Mr. Mr. Horowitz, I have a good experience with Mr. Michelin. He has a good ear. That's all. So were you happier then? Ah, happy, but I could live then. Tell us about the time when you played fake Malipiero for him. You know, I didn't write in the book. Yes. I used to go with Sigorsky very often, the Horowitz, to him for tea. And at this time, we went with Pitsikorsky alone. And we tried to make jokes. With Pitsikorsky, we decided we make a duo, duo for cello and violin by some composer, Marie Piero. He knew that Marie Piero is a kind of futurist. Now it doesn't sound like that. <clears throat> and we arranged so that he starts in the cadenza and I start in the cadenza. And Rahman was very interested to listen because it was not bad. Were you improvising? No. We had, we, we had the basis how to do it. Start the team and then I played and then the, the improvisation and then the cadenza. And the, but after the cadenza I come again. And I go high. Then I go high, I don't know what to do. I start making trills. <laughs> I couldn't, I laughed myself. And we burst laughing, both of them. And he left. He knew it was a joke. Because it's, it's not a question of humor. We took him for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> he was offended. Obviously. He didn't come back for dinner. 
We didn't mean it. It was a joke, musical joke. Happily, the friendship survived the joke because their relationship with Rachmaninoff was something of great importance to the three Russian emigres, who had now come to be known as the Three Musketeers. And Pietzegorsky and I we used to go very often to Rachmaninov Villa in Hertenstein, near Lucerne. And sometimes Pietzegorsky and I we went. On this occasion, Pietzegorsky and I, I we were going for tea for to Rachmaninov. In Rachmaninov, after lunch, used to sleep, like I do now. And um, not now, at this moment. <laughs> and um, Pitsigorsky, he arrived there, I arrived, I took out the violin from the case. Pitsigorsky took his the cello, and we saw music. It was Bacalis, famous for the voice. And Pitsigorsky took the violin, standing up between the legs, and I standing up, of course. And we played octave in the song. You know that piece. And obviously, the Rachmaninov was rested and slept. And he comes out in a pyjama with hair like this. And he played the piano part. And also, when we finished, we couldn't see him, he left immediately. Then later on, I went to America. There was his friend, our friend, Alexander Greider. He used to be giving away Steinway pianos for performing artists. And uh, he said, Natal Mirage, what did you make Rachmaninov cry? Every time he tell me that story, he cried. So you mean he came in when you were playing, he joined you, he yeah, said, and he went out all without yes. saying anything? Standing up, finished with our word. He went back. It's a really very touching story because, because that was really touching. We played very well. You see, that's how I think supposedly gifted people can do. We never rehearsed. You somehow adjust yourself to the music. If somebody is talented, one talent to the other talent. The exceptional musical affinity with Grigor Piatigorsky was matched in the warmth of the personal relationship, which was one of enduring value for both men. But then Nathan Milstein is not only respected by all of his colleagues, but also genuinely liked by almost all of them. From Leopold Auer and Sergei Rachmaninov to Fritz Kreisler and Pintras Zuckerman. But I remember once I saw you at Woolitzer's in New York, many years ago, and you had your overcoat, it was winter time, you had an overcoat, you had a hat, and you came in the room, and, and I, I was played. playing something, and you said, I said, why don't you try this violin? And you just took it and it sort of was over here on your belly. <laughs> you played Paganini, <laughs> up and down and up no, and down. No, that's easy. No. See, How is it easy? No, that's no, I'm sorry. Mechanics are always easy for everybody. Yeah, but not here on the belly button. <laughs> no, but obviously it was comfortable for me. But it always looked so easy for you.
What kind of advice would you give to a young Vanis now? That's what I would, couldn't say better than what Laura said to me. What did he say? Don't practice, don't think with your hands, but with your, with your brain. But you said something about not going to a, after a certain amount of time, once you know how to play the violin, you should do what? Invent anything. And in, in, invent actually. If somebody doesn't know what invention means, you should stop violin playing. <laughs> I can, you can't explain everything. <laughs> Howard didn't explain to me. He didn't tell me how to do it. It means also not practicing only. Mm -hmm. Think how to achieve quality. Practicing does achieve quality. You achieve quality only when you do it without opposition of mm -hmm. difficulty. Because the difficulty, difficulty opposes your possibility of doing better. Tell me, what's the most difficult piece you ever played? For me? Yeah. The pistols. No pistols? But I made for violin, terribly difficult. Oh, it's impossible. I tried to play once the first no, page. It's possible. I got my fisto. That's the most difficult, huh? What about Ernst? Any you played Ernst? All the etudes of Ernst? Not all. Not all, but so I came to our with the concerto. With the concerto. It, you were eleven. No. But you know, I once played that concerto. Later on, much later, in did, Paris. Did you record that? Never. No, but I was very young. Yeah. And I was so impertinent that I said, I will make a cadence on my own, <laughs> without writing. And um, I played, I know that would be That's very cadence-like. Yes. But after two minutes, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> it's not a laughing matter. I, I was very upset. And then what happened? So you stopped? No, I stopped. I went to chromatic scale to the up oh. and with the trill. Yeah. That helped. But I'm very resourceful. When something is wrong, I know what, how to get away without being noticed that I'm cr criminal. <laughs> A little talent helps too. And but I, I must say that please eat because you... I'm, I'm eating, I'm eating, don't worry. We have all night. I don't have all night. <laughs> we, we have all night. <laughs> what happened? You will not believe it. In Chicago, Isaac was there, Francesca, see, and there was a Michael's wonderful violinist. Young. Michael Rabin. Maybe. But you must know that the G minor, Sarabanta, there is a one moment exactly like this in G minor. So you went to the G minor? Well, that's okay. A little change of key. No, but don't think about it. I don't think that here I... In Chicago, I, I bet nobody knew except those three people. No. Yeah, of course. They didn't know. They didn't know. It's very difficult because the music is Bach. You yeah. know, how do you must remember that I played it? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. Then I always had to remember. That's, then, that's to remember. <laughs> but that's not. A, that's good. It's good. It's not a memory slip. That's a, no, not memory. Either.
what you know, Natan, for years, everybody says all the time, if somebody is a great technician, he can't be a musician. If you're a great musician, you're not a technician. But people always say, people say stupid things very right. often. Everybody always says, well, Milstein, of course, he has great fingers. I said, well, listen to what he does. Listen to what he does in the music. Don't worry about it. I'm not worried. <laughs> Believe said, me, I'm not worried. No, I no. want to know from you, you see, because they, they criticize me also. They say, you look so cold when you play. I said, how do you know I look cold? Well, did you touch me? <laughs> what do you mean I look cold? And uh, because it looks easy. Else. When it looks easy, they always say, well, it's, he's not interested I in I agree music. with you. That's the way it looks. People used to, to, to say that hype is just cold. Can't be cold with that. But you know so much about so many things, about music, about art, about people, about history. And the sound that you make is the culmination. A lot of people ask me what it is about the sound, what it is that makes the sound, individual sounds. You have it, Yasha had, Chrysler. It's all individual sound. That means that every one of you have a, a soul, a soul. Oh, well, that's a different story, the spirit of the person. Okay, spirit, soul, together. Well, Let's make thing. it synonymous, fine. But where that, what makes you do that? What, what, how do you explain to somebody that doesn't know about music, that doesn't know about sound, that doesn't know about the fiddle? I can't explain that, I don't know what it is. Because it explain that something that you can, in spirit you can't explain. Because vibrato is part, the result of what you... No, that vibrato is technique. I want to know in words your feeling. No, no, I, that's I didn't speak about. You play it. about. You speak about a B flat. How did that B flat, the beginning of a Sicilian, the B flat? What happens in that B flat? What happens in that first B flat you play? What do you think of when you start that? By itself, si bemol. Only I try to not to spoil it. Not to spoil it. If you were to write That's to good, not to spoil it. Not to spoil what? What don't you spoil? The if mood of what you want to do. Uh-huh. What I want to try to do is not to play too sentimental, too slow, because it's not a... Uh, 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 no, that's clear. I understand that. Not too slow, that's good. Because it's a dance. Good. The bass is separate from the... Mm -hmm. What would you do if you didn't play the fiddle? What, did, what would you do in life if you never played the violin? How do I know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <coughs> do I know? <laughs> What would you do if you could not play the violin? Now? Well, no, no, now, Mela, now it's... Uh, well, I played violin because my mother wants me to play violin. I would never play violin. Did you know you were going to play for the rest of your life? Well, I, after the uh, first time, I would get $25. So. Ah, that's good. I played for the Red Cro Russian Red Cross and the Grand Duchess, uh, cousin of the Tsar. She was visiting always our class. Uh -huh. And they couldn't afford famous name to pay him. And our said, Madame, you go to Grand Duchess, will invite you. But it's very late at night. She, no paying, no, 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 no compensation. I went there. I played Paganini's Mitzi for Caprice. It's a guy in that I never played again. And, uh, and she, after that, she came with a uh, chocolate box and twenty-five dollars, uh, rubles. Two rubles. It was extraordinary money. It still is. <laughs> no, now, it still is. No, no, that's a, now twenty-five rubles doesn't mean anything. So it felt good. Then I decided it's a good profession. They applauded me, and I got. Give you money and chocolates. Chocolate. That's wonderful. And my mother, I drank, ate the chocolate, and my mother took the money. money. <laughs> it's very simple, <laughs> but how I... You're wonderfully simple, and I know that everything you do is wonderfully simple, 
but I want to know it's why it's so simple. It's very difficult to be complicated. It's very difficult to be, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I agree you, with everything you say. No, because if you complicate <laughs> it, you spoil yourself. Oh, you're right. You're absolutely right. But your music making has such value. How come you keep that value? The value of the note, the value of intonation, the uh, value I, of what it means to you. You're so absolutely without any I tell you something, because I love music. I love even more violin than music. I love the instrument. Otherwise, I will not be able to play so long. I love the violin because the violin is really something. Is that why you made transcriptions for it? The transcriptions you made, is that because you love I it? I love it. And most of the transcriptions are not bad. They're very good. Now they have four, four six only. Now will be printed now. It's already printed. Mm -hmm. Two Prokofiev, uh, Tchaikovsky's from the area of Maria Reberi from Tchaikovsky's uh, Mazepa, mm -hmm. and then Mussorgsky's piano piece. Wonderful. Okay, not difficult, but very effective. I took the two Prokofiev's and I spoiled them. But it, it, it's compensated because it's very good. I, I gave to violin more effects that he couldn't do it on the piano. Mm -hmm.
In 1987, 73 years after his first public performance, Nathan Milstein was one of five artists granted the Kennedy Center Honors Award by President Reagan at the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington. You five, you honored five, in your lifetimes of performing, how many millions have you entertained, inspired, provoked a deeper thought, and provided with memories to cherish. Everyone in this room, everyone joining us by way of television, can think back upon some time for which he is grateful to you. Thank you and God bless you all. And Pinchas Zuckerman was chosen to pay the tribute to Nathan Milstein, the violinist's violinist. I'm delighted to be able to be here to honor one of the great musicians of our generation, Nathan Milstein, the violinist's violinist, an artist of perfect technique and profound feeling. The man is a phenomenon, so brilliant, that when we hear him play, we feel exhausted and exhilarated at the same time, uplifted and humble. He has warned us that it takes 60, 70 years to become a fiddle player. Well, Nathan, I have about 30 or 40 to go. <laughs> I'm one of a generation, however, carrying the torch that he lit. But it never burns more brightly than when it is in his hands. Everyone in our world treasures him because he refuses to make a fuss. He disdains fanfare and flattery. There's an intense calm at the center of his being, a sense of self-truth. He is a man neither in need or in awe of fame. And so in some ways, this evening must be hard for him. But no one, no one ever deserved it more. Natan, your career is an honor to music. Thank you. <laughs> 